Okay. Um, today we're going to do Sutta number 26, The Noble Search. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Sawati for alms. Then a number of monks went to the Venerable Ananda and said to him, Friend Ananda, it is long since we heard a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. It would be good if we could hear such a talk, friend Ananda. Then let the Venerable Ones go to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Perhaps you will get to hear a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. Yes, friend, they replied. Then when the Blessed One had wandered for alms in the Sawati and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the eastern part, the palace of Megara's mother for the day's abiding. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the eastern park, the palace of Megara's mother, for the day's abiding. Megara's mother, is, her name was actually Visaka, and she was the foremost female supporter of the Buddha. Very, very wealthy. <clears throat> she built the palace for monks and she fed whatever monks were there. She gave them medicine if they needed it. She gave them robes and basically just took care of the, the Sangha. As I understand it, the, the, that palace had something like 400 rooms in it. So it was really quite spectacular. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the eastern bathing place to bathe. This is a place that's still around today and you can get up on a hill and look down and that's where people are cleaning themselves. That's where they're washing and things. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the eastern bathing place to bathe. When he was finished, he came out of the water and stood on a robe drying his limbs. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the Brahman Ramaka's hermitage is nearby. That hermitage is agreeable and delightful. Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One went out of compassion. The Blessed One consented in silence. That basically just means he shook his head yes. Then the Blessed One went to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Now on that occasion, a number of monks were sitting together in the hermitage discussing the Dhamma. The Blessed One stood outside the door waiting for their discussion to end. When he knew that it was over, he coughed and knocked. And the, blessed, and, and the monks opened the door for him. The Blessed One entered, sat down on a seat made ready, and addressed the monks thus. Monks, for what discussion are you sitting together here now? What 
was your discussion that was interrupted, venerable sir. Our discussion on the Dhamma that was interrupted was about the Blessed One himself. Then the Blessed One arrived. Good monks, it's fitting for you clansmen to have gone forth from the out of faith from the home life into homelessness to sit together to discuss the Dhamma. <coughs> When you gather together, monks, you should either do two things. Hold discussion on the Dhamma or remain, maintain noble silence. Monks, there are two kinds of search, the noble search and the ignoble search. And what is the noble search? Here, someone being himself subject to birth seeks what is also subject to birth. Being himself subject to aging, he seeks what is also subject to aging. Being himself subject to sickness, he seeks what is also subject to sickness. Being himself subject to death, he seeks what is also subject to death. Being himself subject to sorrow, he seeks what is also subject to sorrow. Being subject to defilement, he seeks what is also subject to defilement. And what may be said to be subject to birth? Wife and children are subject to birth. Men and women, slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares. Gold and silver are subject to birth. I haven't figured out how birth is subject, uh, gold is subject to birth yet, but we'll see. <laughs> These acquisitions are subject to birth. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to birth, seeks what is also subject to birth. And what may be said to be subject to aging? Wife and children are subject to aging. Men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, and mares are subject to aging. These acquisitions are subject to aging. One who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to aging, seeks what is also subject to aging. And what may be said to be subject to sickness? <coughs> Wife and children are subject to sickness. Men and women, slaves. Goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, and mares are subject to sickness. These acquisitions are subject to sickness. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to sickness, seeks what is also subject to sickness. <coughs> and what may be said to be subject to death? Wife and children are subject to death, men and women, slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, and mares are subject to death. These acquisitions are subject to death. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to death, seeks what is also subject to death. 
and what may be said to be subject to sorrow. Wife and children are subject to sorrow, men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses, and mares are subject to sorrow. These acquisitions are subject to sorrow. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to sorrow, seeks what is also subject to sorrow. And what may be said to be subject to defilement? Wife and children are subject to defilement. Men and women, slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, uh, gold and silver are subject to defilement. These acquisitions are subject to defilement. One who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to defilement, seeks what is also subject to defilement. This is the ignoble search. And what is a noble search? Here someone being himself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeks the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being himself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging. He seeks the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, he seeks the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to death, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, he seeks the deathless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana being himself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, he seeks the sorrowless, supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being himself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, he seeks the undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. This is the noble truth, or the noble search, excuse me. Monks, before my awakening, while I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva, I too, being subject to birth, sought what was also subject to birth, being subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, I sought what was also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. Then I considered thus, why being myself subject to birth, do I seek what is also subject to birth? Why being subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, do I seek what is also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement? Suppose that being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, I seek the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Suppose that being subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, 
I seek the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless, and undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man, endowed with the blessings of youth in the prime of life, Though my mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Having gone forth, monks, in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Allura Kalama and said to him, Friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Allura Kalama replied, The Venerable One may stay here. The Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it realizing for himself through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma as far as mere rip, lip reciting and rehearsed and, and rehearsal of his teaching, teaching went I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and see, and others did likewise. Is he referring to the Vedas there? Is that what he just learned? Vedas? The Vedas. Vedas. I'm not sure. It could be. I considered it is not through mere lip, uh, through mere faith alone that Allura Kalama declares by realizing for myself with direct knowledge I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly Allura Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Allura Kalama and asked him, friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. Now the interesting thing about this right now is that just about everybody thinks that he taught jhana, but he was talking about the four different states of the arupa jhana. The Buddha is the one that came up with the jhana, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. And that was the fast way to get into the Arupa Jhanas, and that's what you're seeing right now. A lot of you are in the Arupa Jhanas because you've already gone through the four Jhanas. Okay, and he's going to the base of nothingness. I considered not only Allura Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Now he, w he was teaching one-pointed concentration for this method. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Allura Kalama declares he enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself 
with direct knowledge. Then I went to Allura Kalama and asked him, friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you entered upon and abided in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that I know, and I know the Dhamma that you know. As I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. Come, friend, let us lead this company, uh, community together. <clears throat> Thus, Alama, uh, Alura Kalama, my teacher, placed me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to awakening, to Nibbana but only to the reappearance of the base of nothingness. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. Now this, what he was practicing was one-pointed concentration and he still felt that there was tensions and tightnesses in his head that he wasn't recognizing. But there was a Laura Kalama teaching that Nothingness was the uh, That's as far as, reality. no, he wasn't, he knew that there was other teachers that were teaching one step higher, and that's what they called the supreme. Okay. Lord, Lama knew that, but he was that. Right, that's as far as he knew how to teach. That happens, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Still in, in search, monks, of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Udaka Ramaputta and said to him, Friend, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma and discipline. Ramaputta means son of Rama. Okay. And we're going to be talking about Rama, but he had already died. And Udaka Ramaputta took over. The Venerable One may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, himself realizing through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I quick, soon quickly learned that Dhamma as far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teachings went. I could speak with knowledge and assurance and I claimed I know and I see and there were others that did likewise. Intellectual knowledge, be careful of that, it's real slow. 
compared to direct knowledge. I considered it is not through mere lip, uh, through, excuse me, through faith alone that Rama declared by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I entered upon and abided in this Dhamma. Certainly Rama abided knowing and seeing in this Dhamma. So he, he went to Dhaka Ramaputta and asked for the instructions in the meditation, but Dhaka Ramaputta just knew what the instructions were. He, he didn't practice it. He didn't like the idea of getting into neither perception nor non-perception because uh, you get to see much more clearly and closely that there is no God. And he didn't like that idea. So he just went to the realm of nothingness and stopped. But he knew how to teach what his father had taught. Then I went to Dhaka Ramaputta and asked him, friend, in what way did Rama declare that by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma? In reply, Udaka Ramaputta declared the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I considered not only Rama had faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Udaka Ramaputta and asked him, friend, was it in this way that Rama declared that he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma by realizing for himself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that you have, that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that Rama knew and Rama knew the Dhamma that you know as Rama was, so are you. As you are, so was Rama. Come, friend, now lead this community. <coughs> Thus Udama, Udaka Ramaputta, my companion in the holy life, placed me in the position of a teacher and accorded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, 
to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to awakening, to Nibbana, but only to the reappearance in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, disappointed with it, I left. So he realized that he didn't have that personality change that was needed by letting go of craving. Still in, ser in search, monks, of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadahan country until eventually I arrived at Uruvela. There I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with a clear flowing river, with pleasing and smooth banks, and nearby a village for Alm Resort. I considered this is an agreeable place, a piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with clear flowing river and a pleasant smooth banks and a nearby village for resort. This will serve for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. Now what happened here was this was where he uh, discovered, I guess, the links of dependent origination. He spent a long time figuring this out. But when he, when he went through all of the links of dependent origination, that was only intellectual knowledge. He had to realize it for himself. So <clears throat> it took him a while longer to do the meditation so that he, he prepared himself. And I sat down there thinking this will serve for striving. There's other stories about uh, what happened while he was there, but I'm not going to go into that tonight. Then monks, being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, I attain the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being myself subject to aging, having understood the danger <clears throat> in what is subject to aging, seeking the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attain the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being myself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, seeking the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attain the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being subject to death, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, seeking the deathless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, I attain the deathless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being myself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, seeking the sorrowless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. I attained the sorrowless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. 
being myself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, seeking the undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, I attain the uns undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. The knowledge and vision arose in me. My deliverance is unshakable. This is my last birth. Now there is no re renewal of being. I consider this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere re reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in attachment takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it's hard to see this truth, namely the stilling of for all formations the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, Nibbana. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others would not understand me, and that would be wearying and troublesome for me. There, there upon, there came to me spontaneously this stanza never heard before. Enough with teaching the Dhamma that even I found hard to reach, for it will never be perceived by those who live in lust and hate. Those died in those died in lust, wrapped in darkness, will never discern this abstruse Dhamma, which goes against the worldly stream, subtle, deep, and difficult to see. Considering thus my mind inclined to disaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. Then, monks, the Brahma Samhapati knew with his mind the thought of my mind, and he considered the world will be lost, the world will perish, since the mind of the Tathagata, accomplished and fully awakened, inclines to an action rather than to teaching the Dhamma then just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or his flexed extended arm, the Brahma Samhapati vanished from the Brahma realm and approached before me. He arranged his upper robe on, his, on one shoulder and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards me said, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. Let the Sublime One teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are wasting through not hearing the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. The Brahma Samhapati spoke thus. And then he said further, in Magadaha there have appeared, excuse me, in Magadaha there have appeared till now 
impure teachings devised by those still stained open the doors of the deathless let them hear the Dhamma that the stainless one has found just as one who stands on a mountain peak can see below the people all around so O oh wise one all-seeing sage ascend the palace of the Dhamma let the sorrowless one survey this human breed engulfed in sorrow overcome by birth and old age arise victorious hero caravan leader deathless one and wander it in the world let the blessed one teach the dhamma there will be those who will understand now I listen to the Brahma pleading and out of compassion for beings I surveyed the world with the eye of the Buddha surveying the world with the eye of the Buddha I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes with keen faculties and with dull faculties with good qualities and bad qualities easy to teach and hard to teach and some who dwell seeing fear and blame in the other world just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it and some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water rest on the water surface and some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water rise out of the water and stand clear unwetted by it so too surveying the world with the eye of the buddha i saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes with keen faculties and with dull faculties with good qualities and bad qualities easy to teach and hard to teach and some who dwelt seeing fear and blame in others world then i replied to the brahman samhapati and stanza open for them are the doors of the deathless let those with ears now show their faith thinking it would be troublesome o brahman i did not speak the dhamma subtle and sublime then the Brahman Samhapati thought, the Blessed One has consented to my request to teach the Dhamma, and after paying homage to me, speaking or keeping me on his right, he thereupon departed at once. I considered, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? Then it occurred to me, Allura Kalama is wise, intelligent, and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Allura Kalama. He will understand it quickly. Then Devas approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Allura Kalama died seven days ago and the knowledge and vision arose in me Allura Kalama died seven days ago I thought Allura Kalama's loss is a great one if he had heard this Dhamma he would have understood it quickly I considered thus to whom should I first teach the Dhamma 
who will understand this Dhamma quickly. Then it occurred to me, Udaka Ramaputta is wise, intelligent, and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Udaka Ramaputta. He will understand it quickly. Then deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Udaka Ramaputta died last night. <laughs> and the knowledge and vision arose in me. Udaka Ramaputta died last night. I thought Udama Ramaputta's loss is a great one. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. I, can, I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? Then it occurred to me, the monks of a group of five who attended me upon, upon me while I engaged in my striving and were very helpful. They stuck with him through all of his ascetic practices, which were, I won't read about the ascetic practices, it's really disgusting, some of the things he did. But, and he started cutting down on his food until he was only taking one grain of rice a day and he was getting very close to death and then he decided nobody could go any further than I've gone and this is not the path. So he started eating again and those five monks that were attending him, they really didn't like the fact. They said, oh, you've given up the path because they thought this kind of ascetic practice was the way to attain Nibbana. So they got upset with him and they left. That gave him the space to come and, and actually attain Nibbana without any el anybody else distracting him. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to them. Then I thought, where are the monks in the group of five now living? And with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw that they were living in Banaras, in the deer park of Isipatana. Then monks, when I had stayed at Uruvela as long as I chose, he wound up staying there for 49 days. And he hadn't had anything to eat since his awakening experience. And he started thinking about the group of five and thought that it would be a good idea to go towards them as he started walking, there were some merchants that were coming through and they saw that he, uh, he was not carrying a bowl or he just had his robes and that he might need some food. So they asked him if he needed food and he said, yes, I haven't eaten for a long time. And then, they were just going to put it on a food on a plate and give it to him and the Buddha said you can't do that it has to be offered in a bowl but it, there was no bowls available so the devas got together and they had their their bowls that they ate out of they were made of crystal and they put four of these bowls together and then offered it to the to the uh, to the Buddha, but he also they also offered it to the uh, the merchant so they could put the food in there. 
how they they got a huge amount of merit for feeding the Buddha, especially the first meal after he'd become awakened. And then the book, the merchants took off and the Buddha started on his journey. Now, the story is in Burma that it was Burmese merchants that first <laughs> offered the food to but if you go to Thailand, although it, Thailand was much more rural at that time, they were the ones that were the first ones to offer. Yeah. Okay, I set out to wander by stages to Benares between Gaia and the place of awakening. The Ajivaka Upaka saw me on the road and said, Friend, your faculties are really clear. The color of your skin is pure and bright. Under whom have you gone forth? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? I replied to Ajivaka Upaka in stanza. Now imagine you're on the road and you just re see somebody and they got all glowing features and such and you ask them these questions. Think what went into his mind when he hears this answer. I am one who has transcended all a knower of all, unsullied among all things, renouncing all, by craving ceasing freed, having known this all for myself, to whom should I point to it as teacher? Now think about him saying, I, I, I figured this out myself. <laughs> okay. I have no teacher and no one like me exists nowhere in all the world. With all its gods, because I have no person for my counterpart. I am the accomplished one in the world. I am the teacher supreme. Think what this man is, th <laughs> th he's hearing this and he's starting to go, ah, oh, well, we'll see, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I alone am a fully awakened one whose fires are quenched and extinguished. I now go to the city of Kasi to set the motion of the wheel of Dhamma in a world that has become blind. I go to beat the drum of the deathless. By your claim, friend, you ought to be the universal victor. The victors are those like me who have won to the destruction of the taints. I have vanqui vanquished all evil states. I therefore, Upaka, am a victor. When this was said, the Ajivaka uh, Upaka said, may it be so, friend shaking his head, and he took a bypath and departed. <laughs> I'm not going to walk with him. <laughs> but actually, later, after the Buddha had uh, started to have more and more disciples, he went and became a monk under, uh, under the Buddha and attained arahatship.
Then, monks wandering by stages, I eventually came to Benares, to the deer park at Isipatana, and I approached the monks of the group of five. The monks saw me coming in the distance, and they agreed among themselves, Friends, here comes the recluse Gotama, who lives luxuriously. <laughs> who gave up his striving and reverted to luxury. We should not pay homage to him or rise up for him or receive his bowl and outer robe. But a seat may be prepared for him. If he likes, he may sit down. However, as I approached, the monks found themselves unable to keep their pact. One came to greet me and took my bowl and outer robes. Another prepared a seat, another set out water for my feet. However, they addressed me by name and as friend. Thereupon I told them, monks do not address the Tathagata by name or as friend. The Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully awakened one. Listen, the deathless has been attained. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma. Practicing as you are instructed by realizing for yourself here and now through direct knowledge. You will soon enter upon and abide in the supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. When this was said, the monks of the group of five answered me thus, Friend Gotama, by the conduct, the practice, and the performance of austerities that you undertook, you did not achieve any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Since you now live luxuriously, having given up your striving and reverting to luxury, how will you have achieved any superhuman states any distinction in knowledge worthy and vision worthy of the noble ones. When this was said, I said, the Tathagata does not live luxuriously, nor has he given up his striving and reverted to luxury. The Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully awakened one. The deathless has been attained. A second time, the monks of the group of five said to me, friend Gotama, and they went through the whole spiel again. <laughs> How will you have attained and attained, achieved any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? A second time, I told them the Tathagata does not live luxuriously. A third time, the monks of the group of five said to me, Friend Gotama, how will you have achieved any superhuman states of distinction and knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones? When this was said, I asked them, Monks, have you ever known me to speak like this before? No, venerable sir. Monks, the Tathagata is an accomplished one, a fully awakened one. Listen, monks, the deathless has been attained. I shall instruct you. I shall teach you the Dhamma, practicing as you are instructed by realizing for yourself here and now through direct knowledge you will soon enter upon and abide in the supreme goal of the holy life 
for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. I was able to convince the monks of the group of five. Then I sometimes instructed two monks while the other three monks went for alms and the six of us lived on what those three monks brought back from the alms round. Sometimes I instructed three monks while the other two went for alms and the six of us lived on what those two monks brought. Then the monks of the group of five, thus taught and instructed by me, being themselves subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, attained the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, being themselves subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, seeking the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless, and undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, they attained the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless, and undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. The knowledge and vision arose in them. Our deliverance is unshakable. This is our last birth. There is no more renewal of being. Monks, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust? Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles, cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. As to those recluses and brahmins, who are tied to these five cords of sensual pleasure, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, and those who use them without seeing the danger in them or understanding the escape from them, it may be understood of them, they have met with calamity met with disaster. The evil one may do with them as he likes. Suppose a forest deer who is bound lay down on a heap of snares. It might be understood of him he has met with calamity, met with disaster. The hunter can do with him as he likes. And when the hunter comes, he cannot go where he wants. So too, as those recluses and brahmins who are tied to these five cords of sensual pleasure, it may be understood of them, 
They have met with calamity, met with disaster. The evil one may do with them as he likes. As to those recluses and Brahmins who are not tied to the five cords of sensual pleasure, who are not infatuated with them or utterly committed to them, and who use them seeing the danger in them and understanding the escape from them. It may be understood of them they have not met with calamity, not met with disaster. The evil one cannot do with them as he likes. Suppose a forest deer who has unbound, who, who was unbound down on a heap of snares. He might be understood of him he has not met with calamity, not met with disaster. The hunter cannot do with him as he likes. And when the hunter comes, he can go where he wants. So too, as those recluses and Brahmins who are not tied to those five cords of sensual pleasure, it may be understood of them they have not met with calamity, not met with disaster. The evil one cannot do with them as he likes. Suppose a forest deer is wandering in the forest wilds. He walks confidently, stands confidently, sits confidently, lies down confidently. Why is that? because he is out of the hunter's range. So too, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eyes of its opportunity. Again, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eyes of opportunity. Again, with the fading away of joy, a monk enters, uh, abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling happiness with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara. So we, this is one of the first teachings of the Buddha after the first uh, setting the wheel. Um, it, I've, I've read in some commentaries that there, the second discourse by the Buddha was to the realm of the devas, 
and there was thousands and thousands of them. That's according to Mahasi Sayada. The second discourse to these monks was the Anatta Lakana Sutta. And it's a sutta on the impersonal nature of everything. This is not me, this I am not, this is not myself. Sound familiar? Huh. And again, with the complete, sur oh, and these are called superhuman states because they are beyond the ordinary understanding of people that don't do any meditation. Uh, there still can be some pain. Is that the same as the contact that would come up, but not other ones? Um, it's called meditation pain. Okay. And that's that, as I've told you before, the meditation pain arises, it is a hindrance. And it's because of past actions. At some point, this lifetime or before. But it comes up as your teacher. Now the letting go of pleasure and pain is talking about getting into the lower jhanas where you do let go of pain and grief and a lot of other kinds of things. But once you get to the fourth jhana, you have more balance in your mind. Again, with the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of form, with the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact, Aware that space is infinite, a monk enters a bond and abides in the base of infinite space. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This monk is called, is said to have blindfolded Mara, excuse me. Again, by per sur surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara. Again, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This monk is said to have blindfolded Mara, to be, have become invisible to the evil one by depriving Mara's eyes of its opportunity. Again, by surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness and his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. This monk is said to have blind, blindfolded Mara, to have become invisible to the evil one, depriving Mara's eyes of its opportunities, and to have crossed beyond attachment to this world. 
He walks confidently, stands confidently, sits confidently, lies down confidently. Why is that? Because he is out of the evil one's range. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that gives you the uh, pretty good story of how the Buddha went through some of his trials and tribulations and wasn't satisfied with the way meditation was being taught. He knew that there was something missing in the way he was doing the practice. And what was missing is his recognition of craving. What craving is and how to let craving go. I don't do that. I let you know what craving is because this is what the Buddha started teaching at a later time. At first he was he was teaching the, the five monks were very very virtuous in that they kept their precepts very closely. So when they started hearing what the Buddha was saying about his teaching and how to practice, the first Dhamma talk that the Buddha gave had the Eightfold Path in it. And he talked about not getting caught up in ascetic or indulging, but going the middle way. And that's what the, the Eightfold Path is. It is the middle way. Every time you six are, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path. Okay? You're purifying your mind. And the more you purify your mind, the longer you stay with your object of meditation and the more clear everything becomes. So it's a real important aspect that, quite frankly, is not being taught very much these days. Just like the noble truths, everybody knows about the noble truths, but in such a general term, in such a general way that it's just like a, yeah, 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 that's the four noble truths. But they don't have it explained to them how truly important the Four Noble Truths are. It's more like I've been hearing this my whole life and it's not a big deal. So it is a big deal. Especially right effort. There's an awful lot of people that are practicing meditation that don't know anything about right effort. Uh, when I was doing the straight vipassana practice, I was noting everything until it went away and then I immediately came back to the breath. But that's not the instruction of mindfulness of breathing or the Satipatthana Sutta. It has exactly the same instructions, and it's only four sentences. It's real simple. But we don't like simple so much. We like complicated. Now, how many times have I heard that this is too simple, just today? <laughs> yeah, I try to keep it as simple as I can. I ran across a book. It was a Reader's Digest. 
of all the books. And it had this one little blurb right underneath the story, whatever the story was, I have no idea. And the headline was that uh, you understand more clearly when you use words that aren't big. And to prove it, it did a whole sentence of words that weren't any longer than four letters. And when I read that, I understood it completely. I mean, there wasn't any ambiguity with it. Uh, this, I, I saw also a thing in the, uh, about the different people that are running for office and it was talking about their language and the way they used language. And Trump, he uses the simplest language. It's like a fourth grade level language that he uses and everybody really understands him. But as they were more, quote, educated and such, and they got up to Bernie Sanders and he uh, is the equivalent of uh, a junior in college with his language. So he uses a lot of words, but not many people understand. So I, I took that to heart because it was so easy to understand and it's simple. So people that start writing things, I try to get them to use words no less than eight letters, or no more than eight letters, I should say, because that keeps it easy to understand. And the easier it is to understand, the easier it is to follow the directions. And there are starting to be some very successful meditators here because you're following the directions and it's easy to see it. And it's real important. And that's, that's one of the things I've, I've noticed with a lot of monk teachers that they, they try to use more complicated language and they are always throwing in poly words. You don't hear me use many poly words because I have to define them. And when, you, when I have to do that, then we get into all kinds of problems because this person said, that's not right and this is more clear if you use this word. Uh, so, I try to keep things as simple as possible. The thing that, uh, about the Eightfold Path is I don't use the same words that other people use to describe the Eightfold Path. It's, it's kind of rigid, rigid and harsh. And when they say, write this and write that, it also implies that there's wrong this and wrong that. And that means that all life is black and white. And it's not. And I do get criticized for this, but I use the word harmonious. And the first noble truth is, they say, right view. That's even the name of one of the suttas here, but I call it harmonious perspective. And what does that mean? It means that everything is part of an impersonal process. Everything. 
in the world, including you and your bodies, is part of an impersonal process. It is a process. It is not something to be taken personally, although we do. And we get caught up in that, and that causes all kinds of suffering. The second fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right thought. Bhikkhu Bodhi, in his later translations in the Middle Link Sayings, he says, right intention. And I really don't agree with that. That's way too limited a uh, definition. I call it harmonious imaging. Now you hold an image of the way you are. I'm always broke, okay? I'm always poor. I never have any friends. What kind of an image are you holding on your, of yourself? Change your image. I'm always greedy. I always want more. I want to be wealthy. All of these kind of thoughts are images that you don't really believe in and you, you're not very successful with them. I hold an image of being prosperous and prosperity to me does not necessarily mean material things. I'm prosperous because I have a lot of friends. I have people that love me all over the world can't get any more prosperous than that, I don't think. They love me so much that they take me away from America for six months a year and drive, ride me all the way around the world. Come over here. Oh, you have to leave too soon. But that's the kind of image that I hold for myself. Not a greedy image, not a wanting image. Because those kind of things, they're bad images to hold be, because mostly they don't work. What kind of an image do you want for yourself? Kind, helpful, generous? You see what I'm saying about the image that you hold? I have friends in Missouri, they always say they don't have enough. And you know what? They don't. They sabotage themselves. So, all I have to do is change your image. Start thinking about yourself in a prosperous way. Not necessarily in a greedy way. But um, picture yourself, how, how much do you help other people? Don't you like yourself when you do that? Isn't it fun? <gasps> Image yourself as, as a fun person, as a happy person, as a person that is willing to help other people overcome their suffering. That's the kind of image you want to hold. Being kind, being gentle. Those are the kind of images that really mean something. Now, if you are serious about changing your image, it takes about a month of reminding yourself every day, this is the way, this is your image of yourself. Kind, helpful, intelligent. You hold those kind of images and you will become that, but it has to be positive. It has to be uplifting. I have some friends that they, they have the image that they're rich but 
life is more important than money. It's much more important. There is a saying in Buddhism that when you take care of Dhamma, Dhamma takes care of you. Okay? It's really true. Now what does that mean? It means you keep your precepts without breaking them. It means you practice your generosity in all different kinds of ways. In, in ways that help other people overcome their suffering. And sometimes it's just a few words. Sometimes it's just radiating loving kindness to somebody. Do you want to hold an image of being compassionate? That's a good one. It's up to you. Do you hold an image of being happy? That's a good one. And again, it's up to you. So harmonious imaging is a real important aspect of the Eightfold Path. And when you practice the six R's, what kind of an image are you holding? Graving free? Happy, uplifted, helpful? Nice images. The next part of the Eightfold Path, or the next fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right speech. And I really don't like that definition. I call it harmonious communication. Who do you talk with more than anybody else in the world? Yourself, right? <laughs> How much do you beat yourself up? Is that harmonious communication? How much do you cause yourself suffering? And have repeat thoughts over and over again because you think you made a mistake. And you just get out the boxy gloves because you're going to be beating yourself up for a long time. Well, is that harmonious communication? No. Any negative thought that you hold on to is unwholesome, you're identifying with it, and you're causing yourself more and more pain. Why do you think I push forgiveness so much? Because you wind up having a whole lifetime of beating yourself up because you're not as perfect as you think you should be. And there's no such a thing as a perfect being. Even the Buddha made mistakes. Oh, that was sacrilege, wasn't it? <laughs> but he did. Some monk would make some, do something, and another monk would go tell the Buddha, okay, he did this. And the Buddha would say, well, we're going to make a rule that you don't do that. And then other monks would find out about this rule and they'd go to, a, go to the Buddha and say, wait, th this isn't a good one. It, it's not practical. It's not the way we should actually have, do these things. And then the Buddha would say, okay, then we'll take that, that rule off. <laughs> you have to be willing to make mistakes if you're going to learn. But you can't beat yourself up because you made the mistake. You have to be kind to yourself. You have to be gentle with yourself. You have to learn how to forgive yourself for not being perfect. Or forgive yourself for causing pain. Having an uplifted mind and being kind to yourself, that's harmonious communication. 
And the thing with keeping the precepts is there's a lot about speech in that. So you keep your precepts and you follow the Eightfold Path. And what happens? Dhamma takes care of you. Because you're taking care of Dhamma. And you're helping yourself and you're helping others. One of the things I don't particularly like about the way loving kindness is being taught in this country is that it's selfish loving kindness. And it's a mental loving kindness when it should be a feeling loving kindness and a gentle loving kindness, and a helpful loving kindness. It's about practicing your generosity in all ways with loving kindness. Sometimes you don't even have to say something to somebody else. Just radiate a happy feeling to them. That's harmonious communication, isn't it? So the more you can do that, the more you affect the world around you in a positive way. And Dhamma will take care of you. You don't always get what you want, but you always get what you need. Always. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I'd be walking down the street someplace here in America and somebody would come up beside me in a car and stop and say, I, I want to give you a ride. I wasn't thumbing. I was just walking. And it was it's pretty amazing to see that sort of thing. I was getting tired. My legs were hurting. My feet hurt. And I had the thought, boy, it would be nice to have a ride back to where I need to go. And it happened. Dhamma took care of me. Complete stranger. Wow, that's amazing. You get amazed more and more as you keep your precepts without breaking them for longer and longer periods of time. you start to see the wonder of the world, not focusing on the suffering of the world. Okay. Okay. Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.